Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. I am so excited today to be joined by Leon Silvers III, bassist, musician, producer, extraordinaire. You name it, you've done it. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Delighted. I want to kind of roll time back a little bit and think about a little boy that was growing up and maybe chose the bass as his instrument. How did you get interested in music and that instrument in particular? Well, um, uh, Motown had a lot to do with it. I, mm -hmm. I listened to everything they did. And as a young kid, I especially loved James Jameson mm -hmm. bass. I think he's unique. I think he alone made the bass prevalent in a song. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it was just a low end of the song. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really was fascinated about his playing and the bass. So my first instrument was a guitar. Right. But I took the high strings off and made it a you know, just use the four like a bass, you know. Right. So I was destined to play that, I guess, you know. Right. And then this whole idea of beginning to produce, it almost seems like you were like a beat maker before that even came to be. How did you start writing and beginning to put music together for your group? I, well, it did start when I was around eight, seven, because mm -hmm. uh, I would act like I'm writing all the Motown, my own Motown songs. Right. Uh, and I did it so much that uh, it developed into a habit and uh, I started teaching my brothers and sisters I needed harmony so I was like let's see if it, they can sing too you know and everybody held the harmony uh, great and I, my mother heard us and told my father and he uh, he taught us he wanted to see if he could we could learn a four freshman type harmony four mm -hmm. four part harmony because it was four of us then right. and we did everybody stayed on key so that was our introduction into the industry mm -hmm. as a just harmony singers because we didn't have a lead back then. Right. And talk to us about sort of how the group actually got formed and signed and then your actual starting to write for them. Yeah. Oh, well, um, that happened. My mother and father separated mm -hmm. and uh, we were living in the Nickerson Garden projects and I remember the Jacksons came out, that first album, a ABC, no, the other one. And I was looking at it and looking out the window and I said, well, we I remembered how we was on TV when we were younger, uh, just singing harmony. And I said, well, we're going to need a lead singer. We can do this, you know. So I worked with Edmund right. every day. He, he was reluctant at first. Mm -hmm. But I said, even if we do an hour or two a day, and he was only nine then, by, by, by him being 10, he could, uh, he'll be developed that muscle to sing. Right. So he kept at it and we kept at it. And then we started writing our own songs then. And all of a sudden, we did this talent show at the school I went to, Verbum Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took second place because we didn't have a band, but we had all harmony, so we did a cappella. Right. Uh, and in that crowd, there was a guy named Wiley Brooks mm -hmm. who saw us. And he was friends with uh, Mike Lloyd and Bob Webb at MGM Records. Right. So we, they took us there. Um, and I had, at this time, I had r written a song, and I was playing the bass. I got a red bass mm -hmm. and we're playing a song called misdemeanor right. uh, which wind up being my yeah. little brother's song foster mm -hmm. right. but we played it to, to Mike Lloyd and them at MGM yeah. and they that's all they needed to hear I didn't know later though that they put us on the shelf for the because the Osmonds was coming out right and uh, but hey that's the business I get it you know? right so talk to us about that since you brought up misdemeanor I was gonna get there that is so unique of a sound. Where did you get that from? Because it almost sounded like you had started it, but not quite finished it. And then Foster was brought into the picture. Because it wasn't, wasn't finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had other ones that were finished. Right. So um, I saved it. Right. And then somehow, Keg Johnson, our producer, taped it mm -hmm. and he let Michael Wiener he hear it who was the president of Pride Records right. which we were on at that time mm -hmm. a subsidy of MGM Records right. and uh, 
he said, what is that? We need to put that out because right. uh, let's put it out now. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, well, he knew we had younger siblings that uh, sung. Okay. So Keg said, okay, let's do it out. And he talked to me and I said, yeah, let's put it out on Foster and them. Mm -hmm. And so they got the budget and did it on them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you get the sense that they were trying to maybe have Foster become or be sort of a, a young Michael or a competition to that? Uh, well, both of them. Edwin was about the same age as Mike and, mm -hmm. and singing. Uh, and Foster, Edwin, we got older, but Foster was, uh, they, no, he just, <laughs> Michael Wiener just wanted a, a hit and he heard mm -hmm. a hit in that because mm -hmm. this company was, was put together by Mike Curb, a friend of his, right. for us, because mm -hmm. MGM didn't, they were more of a pop company. Mm, okay. So they put Pride Records strictly for the Silvers, but then the album hit on the R&B charts and right. we didn't have no more artists. So he said, oh, let's put that out. Well, he, he just wanted a hit, right. Mike Feeder. Uh, and you know, it worked. You know? Sure, talking about a hit, talk to us a little bit about Boogie Fever and how you came up with that. Well, I didn't come up with Boogie mm -hmm. Fever. That mm -hmm. was Freddie Perrin and okay. Kenny St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Boogie was kind of, it, it, it reminded me of uh, Day Tripper, the Beatles. Mm -hmm. I kind of, oh, that's, he was peeping Day Tripper because that's the, the way the bass line was. But hey, you know, uh, it was cool. It mm -hmm. wasn't my cup of tea because I was mm -hmm. a teenager then. I wasn't okay. into Boogie Fever, but hey, you know, it was cool because I was the oldest one and they had the young ones there. Right. But uh, I liked Hotline better. You mm, know. Okay. What were some of the dynamics in the family? Because this seems to be one of the biggest challenges. You're managing essentially an entire group of very young people who've got lots of different ideas and you've got songs coming out and different parts of records and different people vying for you all and different parts of you. What was that experience? Uh, with all, you know, you just have to let people do their thing. Like when I get with the group, there's so many of us and like everybody does have ideas. I would say first to everybody, okay, what you got? Let's, you know, give, let them come up with it first. Because I do, I do due diligence in my head and before I like to prepare. So uh, everybody, some people come up with something that's good, especially on routine steps and stuff. Because, uh, but uh, you, I, I, I learned that you give everybody a chance to put their ideas out first. Sure. Then you come in and try to put it together. And if you do something better, everybody gonna say, oh, let's do that, you know. Right. So that's how I've been doing it. Sure. In terms of just sort of where the group went, what do you think were some of the challenges as those hits did start to come to keep everything together and to keep things moving together as a group? Or was it really just better that people go their separate way? Well, it was when, when um, when I was out of the group, it was this manager uh, that uh, he wasn't I, I, he wasn't too good to me. But mm -hmm. uh, I uh, I wanted to get into production, mm -hmm. and uh, and they wanted me to cut, s shave the beard and mustache. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have a beard then; I had a mustache though. They wanted to take that off, and I won't, I wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, the mustache stays. Mm -hmm. So when I started producing, it was cool. You know, right. uh, uh, and I met with, uh, after that, everybody still was together, but mm -hmm. I was the only one gone. Uh, and I started producing over at Solar Records with uh, Dick Griffey. Right. How'd you get to meet him and that opportunity come about? Well, we met him through touring when mm -hmm. I was with the Silvers. Right. They did a Soul Train tour. Mm -hmm. And it was a uh, Soul Train gang tour with Don Cornelius and all that. Right. And some. I, we were the, one of the artists picked on the gig, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a song we did, uh, a Childlight song in our show, Are You My Woman? Right. And Dick would always come to the, to the side of the stage and watch us for some reason. I couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. Till years later, he, mm -hmm. after I was producing with him, he said, man, you know that song? That was a bad move right mm -hmm. there. And I was like, oh, that's why he came. Mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, that's how I met him, and uh, I played something. and. Um, he said, okay, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna let you this group called Shalimar, and you know. Right. So that was the first step. So I said, okay, I ain't gonna drop the ball now. Cause I was all, it was like I was ready after 
when you when you do things as a kid and take it serious, it's like you mm -hmm. you're a little bit ahead of everybody. And that's what mm -hmm. I was noticing as time went on. Mm -hmm. Oh, they didn't do this. They didn't do, you know. So I just knew I was ready to do it. You know. Right. Did you sense that it was uh, like you said you found that time and it was ready to move on, um, and that the group sort of accepted that, or they felt like okay, we're with good management in our eyes, and it's good that Leon's doing what's good for him, and we're cool with that. <laughs> Well, I was kind of kicked out of the group, but mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was cool because it, it, I didn't, there was not a, um, too much of a family thing. It was like, I, I, I wanted to um, go produce anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's how that went. I just wanted to get a sense of that because a lot of times when groups are pulled in all these different directions, it can really be heated. So yeah. I was trying to really get a sense as to you felt I'm marching my own drum and you know they'll do their thing and that's fine versus yeah. um, you know yeah, I just yeah, we can't get along. It wasn't quite like that you know everybody was growing up and they wanted to have more say so in things and you know I was I just felt the vibe that you know I wanted to produce because I didn't I was ready mm -hmm. and, and and I actually uh, I thought I'd missed the, the stage thing, but it was cool. You know, I, I like to figure out how to make things work. I'm kind of like that anyway, so, you know, uh, it was cool. I right. didn't, uh, it was a learning thing for me. That's how I looked at it. Right. During your initial period at Solar, did you sense that, hey, I'm with Dick and I'm really working with him, or did you also get some experience and interactions with Don? Were they really sort of collaborative in helping you? to grow your career or you really feel like they kind of did their own thing? Well, Don, Don, <laughs> he was out of it before I came in. He, okay. he, he had had enough. He didn't want to do it no more. Mm -hmm. But Dick wanted to take it on, so uh, he bought Don's out and mm -hmm. um, made it called Solar Record. It seems like you build music literally from the base up, or some people might say the ground up. How did that idea come to you? Because it's not typically done. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that's, I guess that's my roots to Jameson back in Motown. Right. Uh, some people use a keyboard for chords right. or a guitar. I would make my music through just the bass and a vocal, me singing. And I would make the bass harmonic to my melody. Mm -hmm. And then you could, you could really hear a chord in that, right. even if you can't play, you know. Uh, so that was how, I guess, the first stage of developing a sound, you know, was that. Because mm -hmm. I, I like the bass to be harmonic to the melody. Sure. Yeah. What was your first hit on Solar and how'd that feel? Uh, Take That to the Bank mm -hmm. was the first one. And uh, I, you know, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't cocky, but I was like, I worked so much. I was a fanatic. Mm -hmm. I just did that and played basketball, mm -hmm. music and bass. So it wasn't that much of a, I was like, I knew it sounded good, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how much it would sell. Right. But uh, I was I was happy because it's like the first thing you do right. with with a company and it starts selling. And then so I knew okay, what's the next one? I was ready to roll, and I had what I call lick savers. It was dictaphones, little dictaphones back that lawyers use. Mm -hmm. But I call it a lick saver, and I would okay. do melodies all in it. And I bought about three of them. I would have one on the dresser in my bedroom, one in the car, and mm. one at the studio. Wow. In case, uh, you know, I lose it now, because right. I'm constantly doing melodies and concepts, you know. At that time, do you think people thought you were either strange or ahead of your time? Well, yeah, they knew I was, I was uh, not strange, but uh, I was really dedicated, mm -hmm. I guess. And, uh, you know, I, you know, my, you know, I wasn't a nerd or, or a geek, but mm. I you treated the music like that, you right. know, because uh, I, I didn't do too good in school. Mm. I didn't care to because I knew I could write. But bottom line is I was um, always into it, always thinking. I was just thinking only music mm -hmm. uh, because I knew if you don't push yourself, anything could happen, you know, you may fall off. But I, I knew something inside me just kept me doing music and that's what I do best that in basketball but right. you can still do music after you you know uh, basketball you can't keep playing right 
only a certain amount of time. When you got Shalimar and also Wakeside, how did you begin to figure out how to work with these groups? I mean, it's a tremendous responsibility to try to figure out how to write songs. Yeah, well, I had a big family, so I kind of already was <laughs> un, uh, used to, uh, you know, how to, how to do things, you know. Sure. I would let, even in the music, I'd let people, when we get to do the song, I said, you got any melodies? Let me hear what y'all got, you know. Right. You know, someone would be like, nah, I don't, you know. <laughs> mm. And someone would try to do it, but, you know, we would make up, it was funny, but it was real. We would make up things like, uh, if it if it lays, it stays. Right. If it don't, it won't. You know, right. so, and everybody be laughing, mm -hmm. or we put up a sign when when, when they're playing the songs. Uh, this means veto. You know, <laughs> so when some people be playing their songs, and it, it, I remember Dick Griffey was in there one time, and he was looking at everybody, and he was just, he just <laughs> eased the V up, <laughs> and everybody would start laughing. But that's good because at least we can laugh about it instead of embarrass somebody, right. you know, or because I'd say, hey, man, this part is cool. Go back to the drawing board. Let's, let's come again, right. you know, that kind of thing. Sure. But I like that because it, then it's not uh, that double agenda is going on. People mm -hmm. sneak and don't like nobody. Mm -hmm. I do it all up front, you sure. know, uh, sink or swim and, you know, pick people up sometimes, you know. Right. Sometimes there's groups even with intention, uh, or groups with tension with what you're doing. Did you sense that with Shalimar, that as the hits were coming somewhat similarly, it was hard to keep everything together and keep the group together? Well, no, I, I, I was, um, they, were, they were a good, they were a sweetheart group. Like, mm -hmm. You know, uh, they didn't really get too much pushback and stuff, you know. Uh, working with them was cool. Uh, everybody could sing, you know. Uh, yeah, it was it was easy. It wasn't really we didn't get into nothing really because you know I like to go over the songs. Back then you right. would go over the songs and uh, everybody would you know chip in, add ideas. But you know basically they they were a good group. Sure. Easy. Then the whispers come along, and they hadn't had a number one hit and you produced that for them. How did that come to you? Because it's a very different type of a song for them yeah. than yeah, what they were they, used they to were doing. They were balladeer type group, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and uh, I knew I had to come up with something up-tempo, mm -hmm. you know, that'll, that'll fit them. Because I like Scotty's tone. He has an unidentifiable uh, tone. Right. Nobody sounds like him. Uh, so I knew I wanted to have his vocal ringing on the track, whether it's up-tempo or not, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, First, first song I, I, I did on them was one called Homemade Lovin'. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't go too big, but mm -hmm. it, it was a hit for them, and it mm -hmm. was an introduction into the up-tempo stuff. Right. But um, after that, we did, um, I think it was The Beat Goes On. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's funny, on that situation, uh, there was a percussive thing I, I put in the, in the break part, mm -hmm. because I'd go to the clubs and, and see what's the common thing thread on each disco record whether it's pop or or black what is what's the common thread in all of them mm. and it was always a high some kind of high percussive note or something in every one of them mm. and that's because it makes the DJs ease into the next song uh, a lot you know better okay. you know so I said okay let me do that with the beat goes on let me come up with my own and so I came up with something that I knew wouldn't get in the way mm. and, but the whispers had, had already been well really just Scotty uh, and Walter, because mm -hmm. Nick and them were cool. But um, they, they had been hearing the old, old tape mm -hmm. so long that anything new wasn't, right. yeah, they didn't like it. So Scotty was like, yeah, well, we, they want to have a meeting and, and uh, take that off, you know? And I said, no, I can't do that, dude. Trust mm -hmm. me, it's cool, we, you know. Right. And, it's gonna work. And, and, but Scotty said, yeah, but we don't want that in there. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Okay, well, this is as good as it gets, fellas. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll do two things. I'll do one with and one without. Right. But I got to tell you, I'm going to tell Dick, this is the one we should go with, mm -hmm. you know. So, and they was like, okay, you know, that kind of thing. And they did it again. He did it mm -hmm. again on a song called Keep On Loving Me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I was doing mar thinking marketing on this song because mm -hmm. we, okay, what am I? Ah, oh, it's scatting. I'm going to use this scatting right. as a language to right. his girl, you sure. know. And that's why I did, hey, Scotty, what's that mean, you know? He, he didn't like that. Mm. 
It was funny, but it was cool. You know, we, we had a meeting. I said, okay, we back here, y'all. Same thing applies, dude. Right. Actually, this is better, I think, you know. And it was like, okay, okay. And Dick was like, when he had a meeting with him, he was like, well, look, Leon only do two songs, two, three songs on your album, and all those are the singles, you know, that right. kind of thing. So, hey, I'm going with him, you know, right. that kind of thing. So, which it was all up front and, and, and cool, you know, because mm. we didn't get into, I didn't get into uh, nothing with none of the groups, really, you know. Uh, you know, Fred wanted to beat me up to, on, on Lakeside. <laughs> really? Yeah, because I wanted, to, he, he wanted to make it an instrumental uh, with his bass line. He had a nice bass line on it, and it was all the way live, and he was dun, 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 and he just wanted that, and then mm. an instrumental. And I said, dude, you can't, we can't do, you got singers, man. He was like, oh. Anybody in here? So, so we squashed it because I was glad because he was kind of big and, <laughs> right. and muscular. So I, you know, uh, so he came in. We, we got together. I said, okay, Fred, we, I'll do it two ways, but uh, I got to do something on the track. Mm -hmm. So I put, I, I did the music for the, I didn't play it, but I actually, I should have got writers on there, but it was cool. I didn't want to go any further, but mm -hmm. the music on the verse, is what I was doing. Steve made up his own one, and Fred came mm -hmm. in with his bass line, but uh, that's how that went. And uh, But we squashed it, because once it went big, Fred, me and Fred was like that. Right, right. <laughs> so his money's coming in. Yeah. In working with Dick, do you feel like he was acting as your protector sometimes, or kind of more gave you carte blanche, like, this is my guy, this is what we're going to do, and... Well, we just had one, one, one time he wanted to... Um, interject a, 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 an idea and he asked me and I said no nah, that don't work for this and he right. was like and he, but he, he kept harping on it like mm -hmm. you know we got to we're going to do this cuz Dick was had a control thing happen right. and uh I, my way was like okay dude okay you do it i'm out right. you, you got sure. it you know right. that kind of thing and he said well no 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 that's all right you know that's what make ball games you know, mm -hmm. you know and from then on we was cool right you know? And was basketball. And, and, and he had another idea, which was cool, and I used it. So okay. right. when it's good, you gave I'm going to use it, you know. I was just going to get at, was basketball something sometimes that squashed it out and things like that? Do you guys actually maybe go to some games to pick up here and there and things like that to oh, try to get Dick out the Dick didn't play intensity. basketball, but right. I did. Mm -hmm. so I, I would, right, but some of the bands, some of the groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we, 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 we would leave. Uh, every other day, I would take about an hour, f three to four hours. Right play ball, then eat, and then come back, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a, that was a routine, because I wanted to, I was playing ball, I couldn't get away from that. And it kept me in shape, so I did that. Sometimes we play at 12 midnight after wow. the studio, because we had a, uh, the guy would let us into Westchester High, and we'd right. play, you know. Wow. Yeah. How did Solar ultimately dissolve? How did that relationship change? Um, well, I don't, I don't, I don't really know how mm -hmm. the business side of that. Uh, I knew I was doing more production when I did with uh, Gladys Knight and a couple others. So, I, um, it it didn't dissolve because right after that, uh, Babyface and them came mm -hmm. along and they would they had their run, you know. Right. And after that maybe it stopped, right? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was still going. So I don't know how it, you know, I wasn't with, with uh, Dick and him when that happened. I was probably, uh, I was headed toward VA, working with Teddy Riley. Right. Yeah. And speaking of which, how did that relationship come about? Because it's a new, different direction now. Oh yeah, that was cool. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I, you know, he was the boss, so I had to look at it a little differently. I had to uh, understand uh, my position when it came to, not that he was, regimented or a sergeant or anything I just knew how emotions go when mm. uh, and that's some things I knew like like it was one song that I did with him in a, a called uh, LOL right. love online mm -hmm. for black for Gosh. guy okay. and uh, I first I had that AOL that America online thing where it goes you you've got mail mm -hmm. I had that at the beginning of the song and right. then started then I said, no, let me take that off because that's a sample problem. Mm -hmm. So I took it off and I, I let Teddy hear it for Guy. He loved it. Mm -hmm. And then after a, a week or so, he put that, that, he brought that sample in and I said, mm -hmm. oh, good idea. And he was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he tried to, <laughs> he said, uh, okay, well, Leon, um, 
it's, it's, it's a sample's going to cost something, so I'm going to have to take it out of your pay. And I said, no, I, I think, you, but you should look at, check your lawyer, because I think if you bring it up, that's on you. Right. I didn't bring it to you like that. So, uh, but check with your lawyer. Dude. Right. <laughs> and he was also, he said, uh, ah, I think you're right. You know, sure. that's the only, but we got along great, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Teddy was like, you know, he's cool. He was ready to do anything long as uh, uh, people listen. And, you know, I liked his spirit. He, he, he was a good, I learned how to, um, a lot of the hip hop stuff, style right. and all that from him. And, uh, you know, and he liked some of my lyrics and melodies because I would keep the same melody he would give and do the lyrics in it. So it, it was cool. It was a good, I like being over there. Yeah. Sure. Do you feel like the labels at that time kind of took care of you? You and even Teddy brought tons of hits to them and lots of people really did well considering, at least in terms of moving albums. Do you feel like, hey, yep, they took care of me, they, they had my back? Oh yeah, Teddy was cool. It was mm -hmm. his company, he, you know, he, would, he, was, he was cool. Everything was good. He went everything by the book, you know. There was no, you know, shenanigans or funny play or nothing. But he was cool, you know. I found out, we, we were at the Apollo when I was with the Silvers, mm -hmm. And there was a kid, and, and his, I thought it was his big brother mm. on the side, and, and I was like, well, we, we got back to the show late. On the radio show they did, this, this kid and uncle, they won, and they were supposed to come meet us at the Apollo, and we were supposed to hang out. Mm. But we were late, we didn't get in, and they were waiting up at the side, and I was like, oh, there's the kid, oh, shoot. And the guy said, look, we gotta let them, we gotta get them out of here. I said, no, 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 they're the ones that won the radio show, we gotta stay here. And he said, nope, sorry. We, and I said, okay, well, I ain't going on there. We ain't. And I'm going to tell the promoter that uh, it's your fault because you didn't <laughs> let the kids in from the radio. Right. Hey, everybody, come on, you know. And he said, oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. But they got to stay right here. They can't. Okay. And if we come back out and he's not there, I'm going to look at you for that. You right. Know? So I, I did that because he was a kid, you know. Sure. That kid wind up being Teddy Riley. Mm. And the uncle told me, I, I remember the incident, but I don't remember the face, you sure, know. Right. Yeah. So that was a good thing. That was one thing why we kind of mm, right, clicked right, Teddy right. like me, Things you like know. That. Awesome. Um, and we want to talk about some of your more recent projects that you're working on. You've worked with so many people. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, right now I'm working on uh, with my son mm -hmm. and my album and, and he, you know I want him to work with me uh, on the project finishing it up and he's gonna be singing on it and and this artist Elijah uh, who's a young he's he has a great tone good singing and he's gonna be a good writer mm -hmm. because he, he writes fluently and fast personality is cool he's got what it takes to make it he's not restless humble and he's smart you know uh, working on him and this other artist, Phoenix, a female, mm -hmm. that, uh, that's really good. She can do anything I tell her, you know, that right. kind of, not that she don't write too, she does too, but it's like, I really see the potential and both of them have great tones mm -hmm. and that's the, that's the start of it. Uh, and they embellish and make the song better because of their tone and that's a lot, lot to do with it, you know. So I'm working on their stuff now. Awesome. Talk to us a little bit more about working with your son and how that feels, fulfilling the challenges, the admiration. Yeah. Hey, that, that's like, I mean, that make me feel good because what, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, producers, writers, they don't want their pops on this, you know right. what I'm saying? But we, we kept, you know, in touch the right way. Like, mm -hmm. I would let him hear something, he would let me hear something because I got him his equipment when he was like six, I mean, seven or eight years old. Right. Uh, so he's been doing it at a young age like I was, but mm -hmm. with the computers and stuff. Right. So I knew he was gonna do it. I knew he was gonna, he had, he had the ear for it. So uh, when, um, there's, there's no pushback at all when, when we get, to, cause I'm like, okay, I want you to do your thing. Like he did a song on Nicole's album uh, and uh, he got ready to sing and I was producing, but then I'm like, okay, dude, I'm, you sit here and you, you, you already know what you're going to sing. And I turned the mic to him and he finished it off on his own because 
he's a producer writer too and I right. wanted his new vibe right. on the record as opposed to what I was going to do you know sure. talk to us about that kind of fusion kind of bringing the best of the old and best of the new do you feel like it's increasing a little bit more that some of the new schools appreciating what you all do and bring to the table with real instruments real vibes and things of that nature and really doing the work as opposed to only relying on computers yeah fusion is it that's that's what it always is that that's that's how you start a new sound uh, uh fusing the old with the new because you learn from the old like if you're a kid you're going to listen to what's there by the right. time you're older you have your sound, so it's always uh, a good fusion to, you know, to do that uh, because that's what I'm doing now. You, 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 it, can, it can work in the same song, you know. Sometimes you have to change a word here and there, a melody here and there, but if you know when and where to put that, then you can be successful because that's what it is. It's yeah. always fusion. Talking about success, what are maybe one or two elements or time situations where you're like, wow, this is amazing. I'm so glad I did this. I'm so glad I was there. Everything just came together perfectly, and I feel like these are highlights of my career. Oh, yeah. I, I remember <laughs> the one big one was when Dick called me and said, the beat goes on, jump 70 notches. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, okay. It's about to happen. Yeah. And I was at Norm's. Uh, what's it? Norms, yeah, the, the restaurant over on La Cienega. Mm -hmm. I got there at around nine or 10, and I was so, like, I was in shock almost, like, and I was thinking about, uh-oh, I'm gonna be able to get a car, a house, I'm gonna get a Benz, I'm, you know. And then it's like, I started thinking, wait a minute, what if that's the only one? Mm -hmm. What if I can't duplicate? And then I, I was just mm -hmm. thinking all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wind up until eight in the morning. I was still mm -hmm. there after I ate and then ate breakfast. Wow. And I was still thinking about, and then it came to me, okay, just relax. Do what you do when you was a young kid. Right. Just keep listening. Mm -hmm. If you're into it, you got to keep listening and don't fool yourself about it. it, it you don't you gonna, you gonna know what you're from, where you're from, if it's old school or new, you know. But to be true for yourself, you always have to listen right. to the radio if that's what you're going to be into, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody experiences ups and downs. Was there a period of time where you either had self-doubt or challenges or you felt like, gosh, I can't believe that things aren't going right? Never. Because mm -hmm. I, I believe in if you're going to do something, I, I didn't put no goals in front of me. Like, if I don't make it by this time, I'm going to do something else. Never. Because if you do that, you may as well stop now mm. and just go do, because this is what I do best. I wanted to keep at it. You're only going to get better you stick with something. Sure. The show's called Music and Medicine. When you hear those words, what does that mean to you? Now, that's, that's a great idea because we're human. And music, you have to take care of your throat. You got to take care of your body. Mm. Your, so medicine is part of that. <laughs> I mean, as you grow older, you, you, you want to keep performing. Most artists do. They want to keep going till they fall, you know. Right. <laughs> so it, it's a great combination. Go hand in hand. Some things for the wrong reasons sometimes. But uh, I think I know a lot of friends and singers that had to get their throat because they're singing bad. They were singing the wrong way. I had the no no nodules, nodules mm -hmm. on. And uh, I was like, wow. But, but they, one of them got better, the other one didn't. So that's actually a, a good combination to me, you know. Sure. What advice would you leave for some young person that's coming up in the business now that wants to be a producer like you have, that worked with so many amazing people? Don't be sensitive. Because mm. save the sensitivity for creating, because mm. that's how you do it. You have to be sensitive to other people. Because it's in a way you tell in the future, someone gonna buy your record, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to stay disciplined and sensitive only for writing, not for afterwards. Because you get mad too much if someone say, "I don't think so," I don't. and everybody just doing that now to mess with you. So you really have to be tough and don't set no goals as far as if I don't make it by this time, don't do that. Because. Mm -hmm you're not gonna make it because of the date you put down there. It doesn't work like that. So you keep going, you get better and better at it. Now, that's, that's what I can tell. Sure, what do you think is the secret of your success and your tenacity? 
uh, my mother and father, mm. <laughs> I, you know, because we, we all could sing. Uh, when I was little, nobody took no lessons. Uh, and when we got together, I could sing on harmony, they did, three or four, everybody, nobody was, uh, and Jonathan, my younger brother, he was three, and he, he remembered all our parts, and he was young, the youngest one. So right. that, that, that right there, and then just determination and uh, stick-to-itiveness, you know, that's, you gotta stick it out, you know. Sure. Last question I promise is, um, the biggest message you want to communicate to the world with the music you've created? Well, different ones. That last thing I said was about it, mm -hmm. you know. That's the uh, message, stick with it, you know. Uh, because other than that, I never really, I just do the song at, at the time, but I never really had you know, one message that I wanted to, to get out, you know, on a song, you know. I feel, I feel we, music is the last, well, the only universal language uh, that doesn't change whatever country you're in. So I feel that's going to always be important uh, in the industry, in movies, in whatever. It, it solves, it soothes the savage beast in, in all of us. So basically, long live music. You heard it here from Leon Silvers III, Long Live Music. I couldn't agree more. His whole career has been dedicated to giving music, giving of himself to create excellent artists, excellent songs, and phenomenal hits. And today, we still see now a fusion of the old and the new. And as he said, that's just a great recipe for the future. And we'll continue to listen to his hits, I know, throughout entire lives. He's put his whole heart and soul into everything that we hear that he's produced, and we couldn't expect anything more from him but greatness and I look forward to seeing what things he has still in store for us. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. 